Today is, uh, it's four o'clock. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first energy power hour, an encounter with the people and the research of the energy team. Um, you have to start right away because the time is very is, uh, short for all the presentations uh, within one hour and one minute. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's long time. Um, I'll give the floor to Joachim, who will first introduce uh, the team, and then we'll start with the first presentations. Joachim. Okay, thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Uh, welcome all participants online and offline to this uh, very first ever Energy Power Hour. You're part of an experiment. This is an innovative form meant to help us communicate uh, part of our, our research to a wider non-academic audience and we are of course interested in your feedback. I'll introduce myself, uh, Joachim Schleich. I'm a professor of energy economics at Grenoble called the Management and also lead the energy management research team. So welcome all colleagues, admin and uh, also students, including several students uh, participating on site um, to participate in GEMS sustainability badge. So a special welcome. And I think also a special welcome to a new doctor, Dr. Zorro Brau, who defended uh, his dissertation today successfully. And I also see some of his supervisors uh, in the room and, uh, and online. So we will have uh, 10 presentations in addition to a short presentation of the team, 10 research presentations until five o'clock. And then there will be one hour face-to-face -face questions and answer until six o'clock, which will be moderated by Mark Oldstorn, which has already opened, um, opened this event. Presentations will be recorded and the recording and the slides will be made available uh, at the team's research site, uh, among others. So a few words about the team. We are in total nine professors. You see the pictures on the bottom of this uh, green slide, uh, one postdoctoral <laughs> students and three PhDs, most of whom are giving presentations today. We do research which, uh, on strategic management, combining strategic management, technology innovation and research policy to create and share knowledge that would help business and society move towards a low carbon future and we are glad to present you a flavor of this research. Um, in addition to academic publications, um, we are also engaged in several third party funded projects uh, funded by the, by the European Union or the, um, the ANR or by companies. We are also working in close collaboration with the Energy for Society chair, um, the holder of the chair, Karin Sabi. Sabi is also present and will give a presentation. Um, we also try to diffuse our knowledge to a wider audience, non-academic audience. The annual so-called Rencontre des Energies typically presents results uh, on, on, topical, on topics, uh, pressing topics from the, the energy domain and typically presents results of a recent of the most recent version of the gem energy market barometer which we uh, carry out since i think more than 10 years now it's an expert panel um, of energy market experts uh, within france and we also um, deliver some non-academic webinars and have other uh, non-academic publications we're also heavily engaged in teaching activities at gem there is a specialized master in energy marketing and management. There are specialized courses within the, the PGE program, the, the Grand École program. We have a, a MOOC. We've delivered a MOOC um, on the new energy technologies. And just recently, and also in collaboration, I think, with the chair, um, there was an, an e-book published uh, with work by our students that were asked to imagine <laughs> how we society back 2050. I think uh, Karin just showed you the book and it's uh, titled Technological and Social Innovation to Transform the Energy Sector. Uh, if you want to know more about the team, I invite you to, to check out our website or to talk to, to either of us or contact me personally. And I now hand over to the first of the 10 um, Fast and Furious presentation. I believe uh, Anne-Lauren Bernet is kicking off this event. So good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, my name is Anne-Laurent Vernet, I'm associate prof uh, here at GEM. And to start, actually, I want to start immediately with the puzzle. The puzzle is that uh, we need to uh, make a sustainable transformation, like transformation of our society. Uh, but uh, that would mean that uh, sustainable products or sustainable technologies, they become the norm. No? But if you look at today's situation, actually they are stuck in a niche where only environmentally conscious people uh, buy these, all those who can actually pay for the extra price. And the rest of the market, uh, if I look at uh, energy, is uh, still based on unsustainable products. So the question we ask ourselves in this uh, research is how can we mainstream business models for sustainability so they move out of the niche and uh, uh, go into the mass markets? I did this project with two colleagues, uh, actually former colleagues of them, Jonathan Pinsel, who is now in Manchester, and Melody Cartel, who is in uh, Sydney. And how did we answer, try to understand, you know, how do you get a mainstreaming of business model for sustainability? We focused Dutch energy suppliers over a 20-year period, and if you look at today in the Netherlands, sustainable business models or sustainable way of selling energy has become adopted by all the actors. But it was not the case in the beginning. So we try to see what happened that explains that these business models have mainstreamed. And we identified three elements that are necessary. First, uh, entrepreneurs, um, they need to build business model. Um, Oui, mais c'est pas tort, c'est normal. Sylvie, could you please uh, mute. mute your microphone? Sorry. Merci. So, sorry, uh, now I lost 30 seconds. Entrepreneurs <laughs> 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 need to build business model on values that really talk to people and resonate with what people want. And let's face it, green, that's not going to do the job. So what did we observe in the Netherlands? We observed that entrepreneurs, they, for example, um, build on values about local, you know, energy produced on Dutch soil. They also build uh, on values about sharing and exchanging energy with friends, family, my favorite soccer club. And other entrepreneurs, they build on the logic of solidarity, meaning that people, they want to have a say with, for example, what happens with all this money that we generate when we produce energy? And can that money be used for my community, for projects I care about? So that's the first thing. Find values that really resonate with people and make them adhere. But it's not enough. So second thing we saw is that it's necessary to delegitimize the dominant industry logic. And this dominant logic is like a recipe that tells firms what they should do to be successful. And actually it prevents firms that do things that are different to really move out of the mass markets. Uh, move out to, from the niche to the mass markets. So you need to actually break that logic and delegitimize it. And what we see in the Netherlands is that it can be done by NGOs, that for example tell coal energy is dirty. Uh, it can also be done by entrepreneurs that try to make the market more transparent so that consumers they can make more informed choices. So we need to delegitimize the dominant logic to make space. And the last thing we've seen is that in this, sector, in this sector, especially, it's not so easy to be a new entrant. Imagine you are citizens, you want to build a cooperative, and you want to produce your own energy. You need to understand what are your rights, your responsibilities. You need to find roofs to put the solar panels. You need to raise money. You need to sign contracts with the company who's going to buy your power. It's a nightmare. So what is necessary are intermediary actors that actually help these cooperatives of citizens to uh, yeah, emerge, in fact. And when we have these three things, look, I'm going to finish on time. When we have these three things, <laughs> new logic that resonates with people, break down the current way, delegitimize the current way of doing business, and have intermediary actors that help these new entrants, then we can uh, hope to get uh, a mainstreaming of sustainable business models. If you want to hear more, read more. This is the beautiful paper that we published. And uh, that's it for me. Whoa. <laughs> and the nice link, because uh, <laughs> Karim, she will present more about this uh, citizens doing energy together.
Thank you. I don't know if I will have a, as I will be as dynamic as you. So nice transition indeed. So uh, this is a paper we published with Anne Lorraine uh, in energy policy. So if I don't have uh, time to present it, uh, please read it. But here the main objective is to give you a glimpse and the envy to read it. So. Uh, in the frame of a funded project uh, uh, financed by the Fondation Turc, uh, we were asked with Anne Lorraine to better understand what are the energy communities. And this paper focused uh, mainly on the, the, the communities that are led by citizens. And we focused our analysis on, on the France, on the France uh, country. And we tried to understand what was the current development. And we made some policy recommendations because we published it in energy policy. So uh, I will skip that because you all know that particularly in France, we have a very centralized uh, energy sector that some of our foreign colleagues call nucleocracy. And we are going from a very centralized governance towards something that is more decentralized and open to uh, citizen ownership and governance. So here I took some uh, pictures of one of uh, um, energy communities that we, we looked at in the southwest, close to uh, the place where I was born, anyway. And here, this is the mayor, and he was so glad to explain the process he, um, he, he put in place, and he was able to put in place thanks to regional fundings and aids. And uh, he was also glad to say that uh, his own citizens in his, uh, in his small uh, uh, city was queuing to buy shares of the, the, the community. Because what is the definition of a community is projects mainly dedicated to develop renewable energy, so solar, wind, uh, hydro, biomass, uh, methanization, or geothermal in some cases, where you will provide some flexibility and new services to the grid. Okay, but here the purpose is um, to um, to open up uh, that service to a new uh, type of stakeholders that are looking for. Um, to give meanings of their saving or looking for a not-for-profit um, uh, project. And the literature also says that uh, it increased the acceptability of the project. To have uh, citizens involved in the, in the project, they will uh, develop in their vicinity. So the objective of our paper was to uh, actually uh, understand what was going on in France about the uh, community renewable energy in France. And uh, we tried to understand, uh, despite some biophysical conditions that are very different from part of France, like for instance wind in Occitanie or um, I could say sun in Provence-Alpes-Côte d'Azur, why we didn't have a lot of uh, energy communities two years ago. It was published two years ago or three years ago. And uh, we were also able to embrace, embrace the diversity of initiatives and realize that we realized that uh, communities depended on two uh, main axes. The first one was about the governance. And one thing that is really strong in some energy communities is the fact that there is an equality in, in terms of governance. That is to say, as soon as you buy a share, you will have the same weight in your votes. And it's not proportional to the share that you invest in the, in the community. And of course, the size of project. And uh, sometimes uh, citizens with this kind of equal governance, they are able to develop very big projects like a wind supply. And uh, when we, um, we made this overview and try to understand what were the different kinds uh, uh, and so on, we, uh, thanks to um, uh, semi-structured interviews, as I mentioned, and also some reports, and uh, particularly we were quite the, um, uh, involved uh, with Energy Partagé uh, Association, that is the French National Federation of Energy Community. We identified and discussed the inst institutional, market, organizational, <coughs> and economic I cannot describe them all uh, because I don't have time. And we also identified the enabling factors. And uh, all these enabling factors helped us to understand and explain why we observe these geographical uh, disparities. Last but not the least, we made some policy recommendations that, by the way, we were able to provide to, uh, at the National Assembly because they were writing a report at the Commission, European Commission about the the, the, the freedom and the accessibility of energy. 
And we uh, suggest that policymakers, they recognize the plurality of these communities, the fact that some uh, communities develop very small projects, despite some are concentrating on very big projects, and they should be helped uh, in the same way, because it helps to spread uh, uh, renewable electricity um, everywhere. And um, because communities are not able to meet the growing demand for local resource renewable energy, we posit that regulations uh, should evolve to offer communities participants to opportunity to consume co oh, consume communities. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, here, sorry, uh, because I was cut. The fact is that we should put a link between the, 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 the supply and the consumption of within the community, because today, uh, most of the community, they produce the electricity, but they are not able to consume, to make, to, to become prosumers, because this electricity is sold directly to the grid. <coughs> Let's switch to uh, Isabel, who uh, will present online. <coughs> Stop sharing this screen. And Isabel, uh, you can share your screen. But your microphone is on mute still. Uh, you need to allow me to, to to share. Ah, okay, I can share the mic already. Okay, can can you see it? Yes. Let me. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Go Here I'm going. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Isabel Vodas uh, and I'm presenting you a quarter work that looks at uh, the relationship between the extent of firms' involvement in exporting and the intensiveness of their production activities. So we, we argue that the reliance on resource intensive production technologies to produce sophisticated products for exports associated with the relative permissive environmental policies may contribute to a positive association between energy intensity in production and export intensity in, a, in an emerging uh, economy. So uh, we hypothesize that in China, the energy intensity of production oriented um, activities to the domestic market is going to be lower to that observed in the production oriented to the to uh, of the production oriented to the international markets. So uh, empirically, what we do, we use a sample of uh, 468 Chinese firms. These, uh, these firms were classified by the Ministry of Science and Technology of China as users of new or advanced technologies. Uh, these firms were all located in, in, a, in, a, in a specific region in China, in Hebei province. And the sources of our data are uh, the, the national survey that they use um, for, for exactly for on these, let's say, targeting these, these uh, enterprise in, in nation I and the new tech, uh, tech uh, industry development zones. Uh, as a method, and given the nature of our, um, the fractional nature of our uh, dependent variable, we estimate our model using a one part and two parts fractional uh, profit model. The major findings, so we find that uh, a positive association between the firm's energy use intensity and their exporting activity. Uh, so this positive uh, relationship holds across industries with different uh, technological characteristics. In particular, they, 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 this, we find this positive relationship also when we split the sample between low tech and high tech industry. And we find that this positive relationship between the intensity of energy use uh, um, in production and their uh, intensity of, of exporting activities is particularly salient in industries characterized by high levels of energy intensity. So while previous uh, industry level studies uh, hide the heterogeneity among firms in terms of their production and technology, uh, uh, their production technologies, our study shows that technology is differentiated between export demand and domestic demand oriented production. So uh, uh, the implications of this study are the following ones. So we argue that in an environmental sustainable export oriented path development in emerging economies, this calls for a better international coordination and cooperation. This, this uh, coordination and cooperation is needed to develop and diffuse clean technologies, but also for harmonize the, the climate and sustainable related policies between the industrialized and emerging in countries. Uh, we stress as well that uh, given uh, that in, in this, uh, this international co co coordination needs also to include both industrialized countries and emerging economies, but essentially as well multinational uh, corporations, because without their commitment, these policies uh, might uh, likely to, to fail. Thank you very much for your attention. This is the reference of the study that uh, I tried to summarize in these five minutes. Thank you very much, Isabel. That was very Thank you.
uh, concise, <coughs> efficient. I will now go to uh, Julia's presentation. Hi everyone. So I'm Julia Dafai, a PhD student here. Uh, and this presentation is about hydrogen trucks, renewable hydrogen trucks. So why hydrogen trucks? Because diesel trucks are problematic. They... Are they? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they pollute heavily, so they contribute to climate change, uh, of course, but also to other forms of uh, life destruction. So air, water, and land pollution through uh, tire abrasion, for instance, and uh, other interactions with the environment. Uh, there's also issues of congestions, uh, logistical issues, especially with e-commerce, and complex interdependencies. So all of this uh, makes me argue that it is a wicked problem. A uh, wicked problem is a complex problem that, uh, is, uh, that is known to be impossible to solve linearly. That is, you cannot solve each dimension of the problem independently of the other. It requires a holistic view of the system. Uh, the problem is that the European policies uh, regarding hydrogen trucks, basically they aim to substitute technology. They aim to substitute diesel for hydrogen. And that sounds very linear. So uh, the question here is, if trucking is indeed a wicked problem, uh, sh what should we expect in terms of results from these policies? So I don't really have time to go into the, uh, the method I use, but it's a well to analysis, <coughs> and I look at externalities. Um, that is the, uh, the costs that are not borne by uh, the end users of the technology. That is, when you order something on Amazon, typically you do not pay for the air pollution associated with the order. That's an externality. And it's borne by both humans and animals and plants and so on, future generations and so on. So first, uh, diesel, how do we get diesel into a truck? So it starts with a refinery and then it's transfer extraction, I mean. Okay. Uh, transported to a refinery, then refined, then transported to a gas station, and the truck drives away. So uh, externalities can be calculated and they're related to um, uh, greenhouse gases and air pollution. So it can be turned into a dollar value, in this case about 20 euro. Uh, per uh, the transportation of merchandise over 100 kilometers for a typical large truck. So a uh, hydrogen supply chain, in contrast, looks like this. So it starts with solar energy or wind. Uh, the electricity goes into the grid. The electricity is drawn from the grid by a uh, hydrogen station. And uh, <laughs> the truck, the hypothetical truck, because they don't quite exist yet, drives away. So uh, externalities can be <laughs> all the points of those supply chains and compare. So what do we get here? Well, the first uh, perspective, and that's fairly well understood already, is that hydrogen trucks are uh, inefficient. That is, they require significantly more energy than their diesel counterpart. It's not the same kind of energy. One is renewable energy, the other one is fossil fuel based. But still, if we're, we need energy efficiency moving forward, and this is essentially the opposite. In terms of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, it looks better in the sense that uh, by 2030, the carbon intensity of moving merchandise with a hydrogen truck would be reduced by a factor of about three. And by 2050, subject to uh, some optimistic assumption about technology development and so on, by a factor of 10. So that that looks positive in terms of uh, policy outcomes. Yet, if you, if you look at the uh, total externalities, it's not so great. As you can see here, um, the externalities from hydrogen are about twice as large uh, once, once monetized in terms of euros as the ones uh, from diesel trucks. And that is largely due to the integration of renewable electricity, intermittent electricity into the grid. So, um, in terms of conclusion, so it, it doesn't look so good. So, this policy is likely to uh, not 
work so well and create large externalities. So, and here I'm talking only about predictable externalities. Those I can identify, wicked problems are known to create unpredictable externalities, which by definition I cannot show here. Um, so, a uh, possible way forward would be to consider the issue of transportation as a wicked problem, that is to take a systemic perspective to it. And one possible solution would be to start reducing the number of trucks on the road and then looking at uh, better technologies. Thank you. Thanks. And then it's Dagens. Hi, uh, this paper is about, it's not a paper yet, it's a project. It's a machine learning model of aggregate demand for uh, electricity demand in the Grenoble metropolitan region. And what we do is take a predictive model of electricity demand for our region, which is run on a machine learning algorithm, and then we try and improve it. This is a partnership with your local electricity utility if you live in the Grenoble region, oh, Grenoble yes. Electricity and Gas. And GEG has the problem of making forecasts for planning purposes about how much electricity we all will be consuming collectively at least a month ahead, if not a year ahead. Why? Because it needs to buy electric power or produce electric power for us all to keep the lights on. So the problem is if it uh, buys too much power, if we overestimate how much power we'll need a year from now on December 1st, 2023, that's expensive. But it's even more expensive if GEG underestimates how much power we will consume in a year, because then it has to buy expensive power on the spot market. So these forecasts are a, uh, a problem worth hundreds of thousands of euros, we can say. Yeah? We approached this problem starting from uh, a machine learning basis, which is a kind of uh, uh, approach that GEG currently uses to make forecasts. But instead of trying to advance machine learning technology, itself, we said, is there anything that classical statistical methods can add to or augment this machine, this machine learning approach? So we're trying to improve our prediction of a machine learning model using some sort of classical statistical methods. And these are really two different epistemologies. If you look at the way that we construct knowledge using classical methods and machine learning methods, machine learning is uh, data-driven, it's uh, bottom-up, whereas statistical methods Theory is king. We're often doing inference and we're testing ideas using some tools of classical, classical statistics. <coughs> so what did we do? We had some data. This is hourly data on aggregate electricity consumption for the whole metropolitan region, right? And it's hourly. So there are 17,000 or so observations in a year. I smoothed this out here. So you have 2017 right up to 2022, or the last week of 2021. And we focus on commercial electricity consumption left um, because it was the harder problem. We defined a training period where we trained our model to be smart and make good predictions. And then we applied it to a forecast period where we were able to test the quality of our predictions against what we actually observe. We use some different variables. Those are the temperature, the wind speed, the um, neb neb nebulosity, and uh, others to construct our model. And then we added some um, test variables, including uh, we tried um, doing data reduction by making a, a, an index of those weather variables I described. We tested a hypothesis, even though you don't really do hypothesis testing with machine learning, but as scientists we do. We tested the idea that momentum matters using lags of the level of consumption. And we also tested um, uh, some, uh, what's called a smoother. And 
we were able to improve the against the baseline model. These are mean average percent errors. It's an indicator of how good or bad your forecast is. So a smaller MAPE means a higher quality forecast. We were able to improve it from 6.4% average error in our baseline model to 2.6% in, uh, in our best model. This is a year ago today. The red line is the baseline forecast, our baseline model, uh, the one we tried to improve. The blue line is what we actually observed hour on hour, and the green line is our improved forecast. So you can see we managed to reduce the error pretty uh, significantly. And uh, I wanted to, with this last slide, to show you that we estimated how much money this improved model would save if, in fact, it were implemented by GEG. And some other assumptions were in place. And it's in the hundreds of thousands of euros, we think, uh, especially the month of December. Uh, where the old model was especially inaccurate. And uh, we have some future research to do. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you, David. I think there is a presentation that's next. Yes. Yes. I think uh, share sound. The sound will be shared. All right, so thank you. Thank you all for being here. My name is Ibrahim, and this is the joint work I did with uh, my colleague Xavier Lambert. And in this, uh, in this research, what we try to do is basically see whether there is some potential to create a cartel by algorithms in power markets. Right? So the drivers of this research are twofold. The first one, we noticed that people are more and more using algorithms to trade in markets. And I'm talking about energy markets, but it works for other markets as well. So we know that there is more and more artificial intelligence used in these markets. So this is the first observation. And then the second observation is this one. I hope it's going to work. It's not. Yes. All right. So but I, I can describe what this, uh, what this video is doing, uh, because I have only five minutes. Right. So basically, these are algorithms that are trained to play hide and seek. And you see here that the um, people or the algorithms that are supposed to hide, they can actually use some obstacles uh, to prevent the others from finding them. And what I want to show here is that simple algorithms uh, that are today used in power markets can learn to cooperate, to play together in the absence of any form of communication between themselves, right? So this is the second observation. Now, the problem is that this is forbidden because cooperating in a market is called a cartel or collusion. And when it comes to humans, this is forbidden and the regulators should sanction such a behavior. Now, the question is what happens if it's algorithms? So the research questions we have are the following. The first one is, is there some space to exert market power and create a cartel like that? using algorithms. We take the example of power markets in France, and indeed what we do, we train algorithms in these markets, we code them, we train them, and then we see indeed that they can create a cartel like that, which is problematic, okay. Now the second question is how can we solve that problem? Does the regulator have some means to solve that? So uh, we investigate this, we find some solutions that we don't like, but at least they work. I'm going to explain more about this later on. And then the final question, which is maybe more the most interesting, is how can we sanction this? Because it's forbidden for humans, but to be able to prove this, we have to prove communication between the humans. These algorithms do not communicate. So how do we do? And this is what we're doing in our current research. Well, this slide here is to show you that this is no science fiction. It is present. Tesla now are advertising uh, an algorithm that is going to trade electricity on your behalf. So they can trade on EPEX, on, on the spot markets today, on your behalf using your batteries. So this is, this is reality. Algorithms are trading. Right, we, we code these algorithms, what we call reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, happy to discuss how they work, but basically, two minutes. So basically what they do is they try actions and they see whether they're good or not. Right? So they're very simple. It's like hide and seek. Can I hide here? Have I been found? If yes, I do not hide here. So this is how it works. And we do that in power markets. 
Right, so the first result we have is that indeed we see that there is a cartel. Basically here I show the evolution of the profits of the industry, of the algorithms when they, when they operate in the markets. This is the competitive markets. This is where we should stand, right? This is how things could work and this is the cartel. This is the worst for us, for the consumers, and the algorithms are here. Okay. So they can indeed create a kind of cartel. Now, for the solutions, we, have, uh, we propose two solutions. The first one is to decentralize the AI. We talk a lot about decentralizations of power markets, of prosumers, energy communities, etc. We advocate to do the same for algorithms because when you play, when you increase the number of algorithms, it's like what eco economic theory tells us, competition increases like that. Okay? Now, the second uh, solution we propose is actually to, um, to force the regulator to look into the black box, to audit the, the, the algorithms and to see how they learn in order to prevent them to exert market power and to create this gap. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. Uh, now it's my turn. Uh, ah, no. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Um, I am Valeria Fangella. I'm an assistant professor here, and this is a joint work of two Italian colleagues. And our goal was to understand how to reduce energy consumption of private buildings. Uh, what do I mean for private buildings? I mean by um, buildings owned by companies. Like what GEM could do if it wanted to reduce it, the consumption of these buildings. And here we look at two competing uh, approaches to do it. One is to use technology, technological renovation. So either you optimize the energy consumption of the building through, um, for example, the automation of indoor settings and temperature, uh, of indoor, um, sorry, settings. And uh, if you go for technological innovation, you see that you take out the responsibility of consumption from the human and you put it on the technology directly. So the completely uh, opposite approach is to motivate the people within the building to change their behavior. And how, for example, you could implement some interventions that uh, motivate the employees or the, or the people to switch off the appliances when they leave um, overnight. And we call this type of um, intervention as behavior intervention, because the goal is to change the behavior of people. So what we do, um, <clears throat> we evaluate the effectiveness of these two types of policies uh, through two field interventions that were put in place by the Italian bank uh, that aimed at reducing the electricity consumption of its branches. And so we have both a technological innovation uh, that was put in place to 70 branches of the company, and it was implemented in 2015. And we also have a behavioral intervention uh, that the company put in place, the bank put in place. And the idea was to... Uh, the, the behavioral intervention consisted in a game to motivate the employees to change their behavior. Um, and especially this was called energy saving competition, so employees of more than 500 branches were involved in this game, and, and the, the, the game went on for one year in 2018. So our goal was to um, assess the effectiveness of these two interventions on the actual electricity consumption of the, of, the, of the bank. And we see that the technological innovation, not surprisingly, had a very strong effect on the energy consumption of the branches, uh, especially outside the work schedule, so in the night. And second, we see that the behavioral intervention had a small effect, uh, but still we see that uh, employees reacted to the policy, so something happened. Uh, so we see actually a consumption outside the work schedule. So it might mean that the behavioral intervention motivated employees to switch off flights and appliances when they left overnight. And they also really liked the game, so that's also a positive outcome so that we can in, involve um, also the employees in the energy transition. Yes? Yes, okay. So implications, uh, technological innovation appear to be more effective in absolute terms, but also if you consider the cost effectiveness, because of course, technological renovations are much more expensive. But if you consider the level of savings that they provide, they are also more cost effective, at least in our case. 
um, compared to behavioral intervention, because if you think it was just a game to motivate employees to reduce their consumption. And in general, um, as a take home message, it could be that uh, if you are a company and you want to reduce the energy consumption of your uh, buildings, you might focus on the consumption outside the work schedule because it's when employees are not there, so at least you don't reduce the comfort of your employees. And if you want to know more, this paper was published this year, so you can go online and search for it. Okay. Thank you. Four minutes. <laughs> okay. Yes, it's, uh, it's my turn. So I'd like to um, present a paper about um, a labeling of appliances. And the question is, uh, do consumers care about the life cycle properties of house appliances? <coughs> because it's worked with a little bit uh, colleagues, you know, Charlotte uh, and Corinne, uh, but also Antoine Leon from Fraunhofer in Germany. Um, because currently, uh, appliances like fridges, they have energy labels. Uh, you might recognize that. Uh, but they have information about the energy consumption during the usage phase of the appliance. However, uh, if we look at the climate impact of appliances, a part of it, a substantial part, roughly 20%, happens in the production phase. And that information is not available to con consumers yet. But in a transition towards a circular economy, as the European Union likes to do, um, you have to account for the entire life cycle. So why not include those phases, information about those phases that also have an impact on, uh, on climate change? Um, currently, new regulations are being produced that require uh, much more information uh, about products' uh, environmental impacts, especially uh, including all life cycle phases, uh, which will be up for what's well, a commission proposal, which will be up for, for debate. But we do know little about uh, if consumers care about uh, properties uh, other than uh, of life cycle properties. Um, so we did a study in Germany among about 404 households, and we asked them in a hypothetical way, so imagine that the refrigerator is broken down, you need to buy a new one, then which of the following refrigerators would you uh, choose? Now, we showed them uh, two refrigerators at a time with different characteristics, like uh, characteristics you would normally choose a refrigerator on, but also some uh, information about the energy consumption that was used for producing the appliance. And then consumers had to choose which refrigerator they would choose based on these criteria, or these, uh, these characteristics. And then we did this multiple times uh, for each consumer. And then we could find out, okay, which criteria have an effect on the choices and which criteria uh, are valued uh, most. And then you see some common things at higher prices, people don't like it, a larger refrigerator they do like, um, but there's also some um, interest in life cycle properties such as energy use consumption during the usage phase and which is uh, you can see by the uh, the energy traditional energy label um, but we also see that embodied energy that is much higher than uh, than than, uh, than average is disliked by people so people do have some interest in that uh, however um, we don't see that for average embodied energy compared to lower than average embodied energy. So interest might be uh, limited to significant differences in embodied energy. Um, we can also identify different consumer classes within the group of customers. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the largest class, the energy savers, uh, 40%, they have a special interest in, uh, uh, in this high energy class. There are price sensitives that mainly care for low prices. Uh, and probably also <laughs> consumption during the usage phase. And there's a class of quality seekers that uh, do not care much about price or embodied energy, but do care about luxury things like size and uh, consumer ratings and warranty. Um, we also asked whether um, there, people think there, there should be a label uh, for uh, embodied energy and energy consumption during production phase. And then we see that the majority of people do agree that uh, there should be such a label. And then if we ask how much they would consider each of the following life uh, cycle criteria, like durability, environmentally friendly uh, materials, recyclability, energy use to manufacture, then a large share, uh, close to uh, half, 
um, do uh, agree that uh, do to take this uh, into consideration. Uh, but there's a, mark, a mark, uh, remarkable difference between durability and the other uh, life cycle criteria, and we uh, suggest that that has to do with uh, the fact that durability has a direct private benefit, while the others, the benefit of the other uh, factors, uh, largely are social. So, in conclusion, uh, consumers are modestly interested in embodied energy, meaning the energy uh, used during the production of the appliance, um, but that is limited to significant difference. So, with implications for if there would be a label, then it maybe uh, a few categories would suffice. Um, life cycle properties with direct private benefits, but benefits are much more considered by individual consumers when they make a purchase decision. Um, and uh, our information also suggests that consumers should have access to information about durability and recyclability. And this is support for the current uh, EU proposal for uh, what's called ESPR, Environment uh, Eco-Design for Sustainable Product Regulation. Thank you. It's my turn. <laughs> I manage the good life, and uh, I have the pleasure of presenting a research project on the preferences uh, of landlords and owner occupiers for thermal retrofits in multi owner buildings. This is a project that, was, uh, a uh, that we were able to do thanks to financing from the Energy Chair for Society. And I promise you, the title is about the longest thing in my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, why do we look at thermal retrofits? So, what some of you might know. Uh, that the France wants to make all buildings nearly zero emission buildings by 2050, but to be able to achieve this target, the current retrofit rates must really increase and must increase rapidly. Now, this seems to be particularly problematic in multi-owner buildings that account for 28% of the building stock in France. Why is this problematic in multi-owner buildings? Well, in a multi-owner building, you usually you are an owner and you live with other owners that you don't know, that you didn't choose. And you all have to make a common decision, invest a lot of money for a retrofit. So you can imagine it's quite difficult to find, a, to make a decision together with people you don't know and maybe don't even like. <laughs> but you still have to do it if you want to, if you want to retrofit your building. So that's why it's problematic. Now, what we wanted to do in this research project, we wanted to learn a bit more about preferences of landlords and owner occupiers in these multifamily buildings to a better target policy to see where we might need to have alternative financing mechanisms in particular. And to this purpose, we investigated, we surveyed about the 1,300 owner occupiers and landlords in France. Uh, now, the survey was quite lengthy, and I'm just going to present a few selected results that are particularly interesting. First thing, uh, um, and that's a bit on the dark side of things, uh, uh, owner occupiers and landlords seem to be very poorly informed about the energy issues in general. Just to give you one example, uh, less than half of them, uh, almost half of them, do not know the energy label of their apartment. Uh, and uh, that's particularly shocking for landlords because they are supposed to communicate that information to their tenants, but they don't even know it themselves. On the bright side of things, we do observe that owner occupiers and landlords are in principle willing to invest in energy savings. In principle, they want, they're willing to spend money on retrofits. But uh, preferences over financing mechanisms do differ about different uh, owners. In particular, there are some owners who really, really, really dislike loans, and in particular, long-term loans. So they have to find some other ways of financing their retrofit. Now, if they have to take a loan, they don't have cash to invest it, then in general, they do prefer transferable loans. So a transferable loan, that's a loan that, well, if you sell your apartment, you sell the loan with your apartment. So you don't have to pay the loan back after you've sold your apartment. And people seem to like that. The problem is, well, that does not yet exist on the French market. It exists elsewhere, but in France, these transferable loans are not yet possible. So a recommendation here from our research could be, well, is it possible to offer these types of loans on the French market? 
Another unrelated uh, interesting thing that we found is uh, that uh, relative heating cost savings do matter for the owner's decision to invest in retrofits. So what does that mean? Well, simply put, uh, if you think that your neighbor will benefit more from the retrofit, you don't want to invest or you're less willing to invest. What does this imply? Well, essentially two things. First thing, the distribution of costs and benefits should be fair. And the second thing, well, there should also be good communication of who benefits and who pays how much within a building so that there aren't any misunderstandings about people being advantaged or disadvantaged from this common decision to retrofit in their building. Um, last thing I would like to point out, uh, we do see that both the landlords and owner occupiers are willing to invest. Uh, so often uh, what's found or observed is that landlords don't want to invest because they don't benefit directly from the energy savings. Uh, we don't see that, uh, but we do observe that motivations between landlords and owner occupiers are different. So landlords essentially want to invest uh, because that increases the estate, real estate value of their apartment and also because there's regulation that pushes them to do it, whereas owner occupiers are more likely to indicate drivers related to an improvement of living comfort and reduction in heating costs. So different motivations, but in conclusion, uh, due to different motivations, both landlords and owner occupiers are in principle willing to. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm now going to stop sharing and uh, I'll let Joachim share his screen. Yeah, we can applaud them. <laughs> Joachim. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm working on it. Well, thanks. Thank you all for staying, for staying in time. That means uh, I have nine minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay, presentation mode. Okay. So the title of my presentation is uh, Do Green Electricity Tariffs Increase Household Electricity Consumption? This is joint work with uh, Fraunhofer colleagues and sponsored by uh, the German Federal Ministry of Research and Education. If you click on the web page of a fournisseur of a, um, um, a utility, you typically have the, have the option to choose your um, electricity tariff. And often in addition to the traditional tariff, uh, you can choose what's called a green tariff. And uh, in this case, I've uh, shown you a slide of the um, uh, uh, web page of Angie and um, the tariff, the green tariff here is called Happy E. Um, and that means you're signing, you're registering for a tariff um, that's uh, certified um, to, to provide electricity that is delivered at 100% by wind power, Eolin. And it only costs you about 2.99. So that's as much as a beer would cost you per month. In France, uh, in 2016, um, about 1.6 um, million households have actually switched uh, to a green, green tariff. So that's an indication that green electricity is becoming uh, popular over time. In Germany, the share of green tariffs is even larger and has increased substantially up to 26 and probably 30% today. Most electricity suppliers in Germany, about 80% actually offer some type of, uh, some type of green tariff. And our research question here is, uh, what's happening if consumers switched from a gray, that means uh, a gray tariff, um, that means uh, from a tariff that, uh, that is linked with conventional power sources. In France, it would be nuclear. In Germany, that's often coal, a little bit of nuclear and gas to a green tariff. And uh, what we are particularly interested in is whether this switch leads to an increase in electricity, in electricity consumption on the side of the household. So why may that be the case? Imagine you're, you're going for a run in the morning to uh, maybe lose a couple of calories. So you're running up uh, Mount Jalla and you come down and then uh, you have a large ice cream to reward yourself or in my, in my case, maybe even have a couple of uh, good German beers 
That means part of the calories you've lost by running up Mount Jala, you're actually gaining again into a rebound effect. And in our case, what we are presuming is that switching from a gray to a green tariff um, may, may be associated with something that's, that's called moral licensing. You've, you're doing something good, good moral behavior, and that entitles you to do something bad, less moral behavior in other domains, like Domain eating ice cream okay. and, uh, and drinking German beer. So what, what we're interested in is uh, whether switching to a green tariff actually increases electricity consumption. And we actually had data from a large German utility, um, which gave us uh, information on metered electricity consumption before and after the switch to the green tariff data on more than 8,000 customers originally, and the switching happened in three phases. And we did what's called a difference in difference analysis. So we compared electricity consumption before and after the switch of households who stayed on a green tariff, so who switched from a previously green provider to that green uh, electricity provider, to those who switched from a gray tariff to a green tariff. And the switching took place um, at time zero and you see here by looking at the difference between the gray line and the green line, green line being the ones that stayed on the green tariff, gray line, the ones that switched, um, actually electricity consumption increased on average by about 8.5%. And that's not peanuts. And also the other implication of this figure and that's supported by the econometric analysis we conducted that this uh, switch or that this change did not go away. It was persistent at least for three years after the switch. So the implications for utilities is that, uh, okay, renewable rebound leads to an increase in sale. So this may be a great thing from the utilities perspective. For policymakers, it's not so great because that means the potential uh, environmental benefits by sw having customers switch to green tariffs are eat them up to some extent by this green rebound. And also ex anti policy assessment, they would have to account for this rebound effect. Otherwise they would underestimate the costs to meet ambitious greenhouse gas emission targets. If you want more information, this is a link to the published paper, which is uh, written together with my colleagues from Fraunhofer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, all the speakers, for your, all your, doing all your presentations. The time actually finished before the end of the hour, so it's uh, something I did not have thought possible <laughs> <laughs> at the start. Um, yeah, so I hope you, had, uh, you enjoyed the presentations. And uh, so now we've planned uh, some time for questions and answers, uh, if you have any. The presenters, the members of the energy team, uh, are here uh, for a little while longer. Um, so I open the floor for your questions. So you can answer them. Maybe I have a question for Karine and Lorena for this community of renewable energy. If there is anyone at the local level that is opposing, because anyway they don't want the solar panels in their garden or uh, in the cases that you have seen. Because of course, I mean, with this community of uh, renewable energy, you bring close to home the production of energy. Maybe someone is not uh, too happy with 